Hello and welcome to Bolt Action Reloading. In today's video, we're going to be talking about the Hornady 147 grain ELD match loaded with Alliant Reloader 16 using Lapua Brass. Stick around. Welcome back to the channel. If this is your first time here and you want to see how I and the rest of the community here make our group smaller, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon. That way you get notified when I post new videos and you won't miss anything. Obviously in today's video we're going to be talking about the 147 grain ELD match with Reloader 16. For those of you who caught last week's video you're going to say, this is a rerun, are you posting the same video? But no guys. For those of you that were disappointed with last week's video and you wish we'd done the Scott Saturday Load Development video, this one is for you. For those of you that are tired of the Scott Saturday Load Development video, we're going to talk a little bit about how they relate to one another along with the other data, so you might find some good information here as well. And for those of you guys that are starting off fresh, let's just talk about the load data that we loaded today, and I'll give you guys a good place to start. Obviously, we used the 147 grain ELD match by Hornady, part number 26333. Obviously, we used Alliant Reloader 16, Lapor Brass, and for a primer, we used the Remington 7.5 Small Rifle Bench Rest Primer. The charge weights we loaded today went from 40.1 grains all the way to 43 grains, and in case you guys are wondering, the load data today is loosely based on the load data released on Sierra's website for 6.5 Creedmoor, Sierra's 6.5 millimeter, 150 grain hollow point booktail projectile. All that out of the way, the brass was actually very close to 1.910 inches. It really wasn't worth trimming. Basically all we did was chamfer the end of these cases, and there was about two to three thousands of variance in overall length among the group. Since a couple of the cases were still under that 1.910 inches, I did not want to trim the entire lot. So guys, like I mentioned, today's load development is basically Scott Satterley style. In his particular style, he typically goes in two tenths of a grain. But to be a little bit more anal retentive on this channel, we have decided, at least at this point in time, that we're actually going to only increase the charge from case to case at one tenth of a grain at a time. So we loaded all the way from 40.1 grains all the way to 43 grains in exactly one tenth of a grain increments. The actual data at 40.5, 41.2, 42, 42.5, and 43 grains is actually all an average data that we got from our five shot string that we shot for last week's video. To give you guys the five second version, basically on this graph we are looking for flat spots or plateaus in the graph. I'll put a chart for you guys real quick so you can see. In Scott Saturday's video, this is the data that they gave and I made an Excel chart out of the data that was given from the 6.5 guys Scott Saturday low development video. Basically what you're looking for is these nice velocity flat spots where the charge weight is increasing but the velocity in the load is not. So you'd like to load in the center of, of that node so your load has some flexibility and still hitting hopefully that same velocity. They certainly report having very good luck with keeping their SDs and extreme spreads very low when loading on those nodes. For this combination basically we're looking for those nodes where we don't have a velocity increase or actually in what Scott Sardy calls an inversion or actually where that velocity gets lower. That's what we're looking for in the chart. Now, let's talk a little bit about what we saw last week. For all those charge weights that we saw from last week's video, we'll see where those show up on the graph. And so starting off at 40.5 grains, you'll actually notice from the 40.4 to 40.5 average lot, there's actually an increase in velocity right there. So that probably was a poor choice. And looking at the statistics from last week's load video, it's apparent that was actually a poor choice. Moving right along, since we just got done mentioning inversions, that particular load at 41.2 is right between the 2675 and 2650 mark, what they would have referred to as an actual inversion in the chart. And since we loaded exactly there, based on our numbers from last week's video, you guys will see our actual velocity achieved at 2655 had the best standard deviation of 3.6 and an extreme spread of 9, though it didn't give the best group, probably my shooting though. Moving a little further up to 42 grains, at 2706, We'll notice that a tenth of a grain either way on that, we really didn't see a significant velocity change. We went from 2700 to only 2708. And pretty obviously that the data shows right there, certainly that's not the lowest of the day, but 4.5 standard deviation with extreme spread of 10 is certainly very good in my book. And if that's where I ended up, I certainly wouldn't complain. Moving a little further up to 42.5, you'll see that 42.5 grain charge at 2735. Our standard deviation almost doubled as our extreme spread a little more than doubled. And as you'll see on the chart, Going from 2723 to 2754, again, probably a poor choice for a charge weight to be picked for testing. Going all the way to the top, we'll see that 2779 average feet per second. Though picking that for the five shot group in retrospect probably was not the best thing because it would have been nice to have at least one or two more charge weights that we tested to see exactly where that graph ended up. With that standard deviation of almost 10 and extreme spread of 20, as far as statistics are concerned, it certainly wasn't our best choice. 
However, it, did, it certainly had a reasonable 0.664 MOA group. As I kind of go back and look at this chart, I think I would have probably picked a couple different areas. I certainly don't think there was anything wrong with that 41.2 grain charge, though 2640, 2650 is really not where we'd like to run this rifle, especially if we can get a little bit higher velocity and still get consistent statistics. That 42 grain charge, statistics were pretty good, but moving a little further up, if we want to try and trust that inversion area, at 42.4 grains, there's a little dip right there. That certainly might be a good area to explore in the future. Same could be said for possibly the 42.7 grain charge, but who knows? Maybe slightly over 43 grains we would have seen. I'll put another shot of the brass so you guys can see it with these Remington 7.5 primers. These are a little bit of a soft cup primer, and cratering becomes an issue with the small rifle primers in 6.5 Creedmoor. Switching to something like the CCI 41 certainly might be a better choice, though I'm not sure if the velocity chart would change much or would the standard deviations even open up. Only way we'll know that really, guys, is testing. As I'm showing you guys the brass on the screen and you guys take a quick look at those primers, one thing I did find of interest that I really don't have a good explanation for at this time is you will see as kind of the, even as the charge weight goes up, some of the primers have significantly more cratering than others. Some almost appear to have no cratering at all at significantly hotter charges than ones that showed significantly more cratering. So I really haven't figured out that mystery. If you guys have any ideas on that, I'd certainly love to hear it in the comments section below. Before we go any further, I'm actually going to show you guys the video as we shot this string. So guys, as you could see, the actual overall group of this particular thing was actually 1.52 MOA, stretching basically over three grains of powder. We could probably do a lot worse. Another thing I thought was kind of interesting, so I thought I'd put our charge weights where we tested up there. If you look at the charges we picked for our five-shot strings from last week's video at 40.5, if you actually take the, the four-shot group, which was two charges below and two charges above each of those charge weights, it's actually kind of interesting. If you looked at the 40.5 grain load, from the 40.3, 40.4, 40.6, and 40.7, the actual four-shot group is 0.691. And that group being at 0.82, and the actual five-shot group of shot being at 0.82, maybe there's something to that. Now, stepping up to 41.2 grains, where our statistics were actually pretty good, if you take the shots two on e either side of that, it's actually a 0.555 MOA group. You know, and, and I know I argued in last week's video, the 1.047 MOA group that that shot ended up being Easily one of those shots would have been my fault, and taking one of those away takes it to well under half an MOA at 0.426. Now, two shots above and below 42 grains was 0.337 MOA. Obviously, still good statistics on that load, and again, if you drop one shot, 0.331 MOA is certainly not a bad day in my book. At 42.5 grains, where our, our standard deviation extreme spread opened up, our two charges up and two charges down from that yielded a 0.935 MOA group. For the 43 grain charge, just picking the two shots below that was actually a 0 0.870 MOA group, so obviously that was not a node in which we'd really like to load. So guys, I've tried to beat this one to death as much as possible. If there's something you guys see in this data that I don't, please post that in the comment section below. i am really like to hear your feedback. What do you guys think of this load development style now that we've gone a little bit further with it? Are you guys finding a little bit more validity to the Scott Saturday load development test? I have got a couple comments back from some of my viewers talking about that they feel this testing is a waste of powder and projectiles. And so I really want to know what you guys think about that. To me, if we did this the way Scott Saturday things, it's really only 10 shots. And honestly, even if it's only 25 shots, I'm not sure how many of us have actually been able to dial in a very good load using only 25 bullets. But hey, maybe that's me and I just like to shoot lots of combinations anyway. 
For those of you guys that really like to nerd out, I, I should have added, these were shot at 45 degrees Fahrenheit, 49% relative humidity, and a density altitude of negative 8 feet. I, I do have to say, guys, overall, of the Scott Satterley tests that I've shot so far, I think the overall group from top to bottom is actually smallest that I've shot so far at only 1.5 MOA. I honestly, guys, think that just speaks well for the bullet. I really think this 147 grain is a shooter. It certainly is stabilizing well in my rifle. And with a ballistic coefficient of 0.697, especially some of the lots we've been able to achieve, I really think this may be my go-to projectile. But only time will tell. So guys, please tell me what you guys think that I forgot in the comment section below. Tell me what you thought about today's video. What did I miss? What did I get right? So maybe we can address these in our low development style going forward. That being said, if you guys have any comments or questions on the video, please put those in the comments below as well. If you're not subscribed to the channel and you like the content, please consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the like button. And make sure that bell icon is turned on so you guys get notified every time I post a new video. I really hope you guys enjoyed today's video. And until next week, stay safe in small groups, everyone.